Hi again. So tonight is lesson four, and it's one of great importance, I think, as a, a modern thing that we have to deal with in the church. Really what we're going to be talking about, about tonight is unity, and not just unity for the sake of unity, but there's a, a purpose behind that unity. Well, what is it that God wants us to do with a, a unified body of, of different people who come from many different perspectives? How do we knit that together? And then what do we do with it? It's not just us coming together to get to know each other. It's, it's for a purpose. So tonight, uh, hopefully the lesson will help guide our thoughts in that and help us understand that as this special body of, of believers, that we're not just here to encourage each other. We're also here for some very important work. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the lesson. Welcome back. Uh, welcome to Lesson 4. I've, I've titled this um, One in Christ, uh, A Prayer for Unity. But um, I just want to take a time to thank you for keeping the church and this family in your prayers. <clears throat> I'm always surprised by how many dimensions there are to the, the New Testament. After years of immersion and learning from it and making application to our lives, there's always something new for us. In this book we love so much, there are numerous themes about life-changing things like faith, trust, surrender, reconciliation, just to name a few. It's a history lesson. It's lessons in theology. Lessons in how to love people, how to lead our families, how to be reconciled to our Creator, and lessons in leadership. It describes what heaven is like, and it allows for observations on all the prior books of the Bible and how to apply those events to our time. It's a pattern of teaching through observing how Paul and the apostles were able to make application in the Old Testament values to New Testament living. And some writings get their value from age or a special event that it documents. The Bible's value comes out of how it constantly addresses living faith daily, and it's still reflecting on ancient truths that are as old as the universe. They have not changed. When people say the Word of God is living and active, this is what they mean. As I read these letters now as an older man, I start to appreciate another theme underpinning all of these uh, other more upbeat themes and messages of hope. When I read these letters now, I see church leaders trying to address the greatest threat to their infant church, a lack of unity. Paul spent a good amount of time and a lot of his worry on discussions about challenges faced by the new churches. The book of Revelation shows Jesus holding seven churches accountable for their bad behavior. In John chapter 10, a warning shot is fired by Jesus, and it goes largely unnoticed by the apostles in their formative stage while they follow Jesus around. He says this to them. In verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there should be one flock and one shepherd. When this was said, I seriously doubt the apostles recognized uh, what this would mean for their future. Jesus is talking about an extremely uncomfortable situation that will force them to become something far better and far greater than the bickering brothers that they currently are. To appreciate the inference of this, I offer this example. It's estimated that in the first century, on average, the church grew by 40% per year. Sounds impressive, right? We hear a lot that the first century, century church experienced massive growth, but it can be hard to wrap your heads around what that looks like. So I tried to use Mesa as an example. What if Mesa, the mid-sized church that we know and love, grew by 40% per year? We have around 500 people total right now. So that would mean 200 new people in year one which would give us 700 people at the end of the year. We would have 980 people in year two. 1,373 in year three. By year five, we would have 2,700 people worshiping God at our little congregation. While we initially would be excited by this proposition, we'd be praising God, it's exciting. 
Do we understand what that would bring in demands for our little congregation? Every day, new people coming in, needing instruction, needing help, needing inclusion, and elders looking to give them work that, that is meaningful. That means 2,200 people that had never known a thing about God or would have known or have some variant of theology in their life that was contrary to word would all be here at the same time. They would bring all their personalities, their positions, their opinions into this little family. And it means the original 500, they wouldn't be able to just sit in a pew. They would have to seriously step it up in how they participated in the assembly and the work of this church. Imagine what an administrative nightmare that might be for a church as large as the one that was in Jerusalem. Is it any wonder that Paul lists administration as a gift of the Spirit? The spiritual demands would be crushing to a little group of elders. It would essentially be a full-time job, which also should help us appreciate why deacons were so important in commission so early in the first days of the church. The elders had to focus on spiritual discipline. Coming together is just part of our fellowship. Getting people in the doors is not the end of it. It's what we do while we're together that determines success or failure for God's purposes. Now, we'll be working out of Ephesians, namely chapter 2 and 4. And in here, the Bible tells us some important things about our unity. In Ephesians 2, 19, he describes what unity of a collective of different people following one goal looks like. Ephesians 2, 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and with also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. Now I like that last phrase about a dwelling. When you think about the, the pyramids of Egypt or the temple in Israel being built, these structures were meticulously crafted buildings, special edifices. We like to think of the ancients as less intelligent or less capable, but the structures they built have survived thousands of years. The craftsmanship of the pyramids is so tight in some places that you can't get a piece of paper between the cracks between the stones. Roman aqueducts are still in use in a few places. The Parthenon still stands, and the Great Wall is still there. These were not cobbled together structures. They were well-planned, with strong foundations. And they survived earthquakes, floods, and wars. They were lovingly crafted and designed to stand a test of time to be ultimately useful as well as beautiful. That is the imagery that's picked to describe the Brotherhood's unity. How much does God value this wonderfully crafted building of believers? Well, part of what we know is, is then how he asked for it to be cared for. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. He commissions them with, with a very important task, one of unity. Now, if you're not familiar with this concept of commissioning, uh, it's a transfer of authority. It's trust for a critical job. Uh, when you think about the military, we commission officers to protect and preserve lives and equipment. We charge government employees with the defense of the Constitution and, and preservation of the American way and with upholding our laws. When we are asked to make every effort to keep this unity, we need to see this as our primary goal. I can't think of anything else that's more important. This meticulously crafted fellowship, lovingly preserved by the faithful, has a purpose. Now, as I mentioned earlier, buildings aren't just put together to be pretty. They serve a purpose. When Paul describes these, building, these metaphorical building blocks of the church as a body, he says this. 
in Ephesians 4, 11 through 22. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We come together to do work. We become unified by doing that work together and by learning together as we do that work. I was looking for a good example of this, and I think Solomon's temple project is uh, probably the one that sticks in my mind the best. So these craftsmen were great artisans in their respective jobs. They did great things in their fields, but they hadn't created anything of this nature, nothing this magnificent. But when they came together, they created one of the most iconic and special places ever to grace the face of planet Earth. Second Chronicles 2, verses 1 through 10. Solomon gave orders to build a temple in the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. He conscripted 70,000 men as carriers and 80,000 as stonecutters in the hills and 3,600 as foremen over them. Solomon sent this message to Hiram, king of Tyre. Send me cedar logs as you did for my father David when you sent him cedar to build a palace to live in. Now I am about to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. Skipping ahead to verse 5. The temple I am going to build will be great because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build the temple for him since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? Who then am I to build a temple for him except as a place to burn sacrifices before him? Send me therefore a man skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, and in purple, crimson and blue yarn, and experienced in the art of engraving, to work in Judah and Jerusalem with my skilled workers, whom my father David provided. Send me also cedar, juniper, and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants are skilled in cutting timber there. My servants will work with yours to provide me plenty of lumber, because the temple I, must, I build must be large and magnificent. I will give your servants... The woodsmen who cut the timber, 20,000 cores of ground wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of olive oil. So Solomon commissions this work. He provides the resources, but it's the craftsmen who build this amazing structure. And this structure had only ever really been seen in the mind of David and his son Solomon. When it was over, they brought the experience back home of what they had done in constructing this wonderful place. And they could talk about the great things they achieved. And when they came into town, they could point at the building and say, I helped build that amazing thing. They would experience that pride and remember the joy of the day that they finally finished it. Now coming back to us, each of us has been given a gift to use for God's service, first and foremost. Now if my gifts benefit me in the world too, that's great. But sometimes we get it backwards. Maybe we're a good IT guy, a good banker. Maybe we're great with social work. And these things provide a great living for me. But what if we thought about this differently and applied these skills to God's work with the same fervor? Would we not start to learn more that we could bring back to the world and see impossible things start to come together? When we unify and dream, beyond just keeping the doors open. The same thing can happen for us. Wouldn't you love to be able to tell the people of amazing things that you've done with this body of people? Village Del Sol, family ministry, LTC, youth ministry, hiring three ministers at the same time. That tells the world how powerfully God works in this family and in this situation. He takes different people from different perspectives, puts them together and creates great things. Now Paul reflects on the benefits of this working together in Ephesians 4, verse 14 and following. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 
when we work together to preserve the bond of peace and work towards God's plans and the things that he wants for these church, this church, we become immune to things like the disease of gossip, the abusive talk. We grow up, and we can then speak truth and love to each other. Now, we've all run into brothers and sisters who are not ready for this type of candor. They rail against loving accountability, and they disconnect themselves, and they stop talking to us. But the ones that work together and speak truth and love, they exhibit a different kind of thinking. One of self-betterment and correction, not just for themselves, but so that the work gets done better and faster and creates this, these amazing things that God wants. And not only must we work together, but we, we have to work for the same goal. Uh, a funny story comes to mind of uh, two guys that are on a, you know those tandem bikes, you pedal together to go up a hill. And the hill's really steep, and the first guy is just pedaling as hard as he can. And, you know, he gets to the top, and he looks back at the other guy, and he says, that was the hardest hill that I have ever conquered. I thought it would be easier with the two of us, but that was really difficult. And the guy says, yeah, I know, it was, it's pretty dangerous too. Uh, to keep us from going backwards, I had to brake on the whole time. Now, it's a funny story to, to make us laugh a little bit, but sometimes we can be working in opposite directions and be holding the brake on when we should be helping to push. Christ-based unity takes a disorganized mess of people from different systems of belief and different baggage that they carry into them, into this, and it is a relationship, uh, us being together in this church. It takes all of that and takes all the energy of the individual and puts it towards a common goal. And that collective power of us pushing together is what infects the world around us. It's what allows us to move forward. Listen to this statement in Philippians 1. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a, worthy, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as for the one faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Our unity isn't just an exercise in social inclusion and uh, getting together to socialize. It's not even for self-development only. It's also a warning shot to a world that's lost, to the condemned that we will not fall to their pressures. It's an offer to join something amazing and beautiful. And it also tells them well, we will rem remain focused like a laser. And if you come against one of us, you come against all of us, against our collective strength, against our resources, against our gifts. And behind all that, backing it up, is the creator of the universe empowering us. Remember this. The church defeated one of the largest empires the world's ever known, the Roman Empire. The church provided the basis of modern democratic republics without a sword ever being lifted. It was just unified resistance and pursuit of truth. But some of the first century churches could not survive on their own. Gossip, division, and denominationalism did what the world's greatest empire could not do. It took them out of the game. Of the seven churches that were listed in the book of Revelation, none of them are around. Let's start to pray for a church that doesn't just hold together that just doesn't just have a 20% participation rate to continue on next year's goals. Let's pray for a church that links arms, that defies an angry world looking for an easy target, a church that fits itself together for purpose and walks into the fray and takes on the evils that swirl around us looking to destroy our families, to undermine our faith and weaken the only thing holding the escape door open from a broken world. Pray a prayer of power for Mesa in the global church. Expect great things to come. And expect them to come from seeming impossibilities, things that shouldn't work, but do. 
amaze the world when the things that should not work do. As you get together in your homes or here tonight, I would ask that you focus your prayers on the unity of the church and how to find your role in helping that, that continue on. And I would ask that you let the words of Psalm 133 encourage you tonight. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. May your efforts be blessed. Thank you.